This gray box has a cheap USB camera, a random single board computer I found in my junk drawer, and a huge power bank to power them both. Today we're gonna use it to investigate what really makes our freeways dangerous. Spoiler alert, it's not speeding. As you might have guessed, this thing is basically a poor man's video camera with a telephoto lens. It costs just a hundred bucks and can record approximately 20 hours of footage. A perfect device to, say, stash it on the side of the roads and film passing traffic. Then we can use some basic programming scales to analyze captured data and make some conclusions about human behavior. Very surprising conclusions. It's not the first time I'm doing such a study. Over the past two years, I filmed a number of videos of cars passing by various freeways in my area. I wanted to confirm my long-standing theory that people don't only speed when the speed cameras are around. So the cameras are, in reality, just money-making devices that were never about road safety in the first place. Theory confirmed, by the way. The video is on the channel. Check it out later, if you haven't seen it yet. So, what can be done instead of installing speed traps on every corner to actually make our freeways safer? That's a question we are going to answer today. I'll try to explain the whole research process so that even non-tech people could understand it and enjoy it. Leave me a comment if you think I succeeded or failed. Without further ado, let's begin. This is the video of a freeway in Spain, around 90 kilometers west of Barcelona. It's a pretty ordinary freeway in the middle of nowhere, with ordinary cars and ordinary drivers. There are thousands like it all over the world. For a human, there is not much to look for here. So let's give this video to the computer. As a start, I used this article, titled Multi-Object Tracking with Aldralytics YOLO, to write code that calculates the speed of each car in the video. Despite the intimidating title, the way this all works is really simple. First, each frame is processed by the YOLO 11 computer vision model, which just draws a box around every car it detects. Back in the 2010s, this was what people used to call artificial intelligence. Next, by tracker, an object tracking algorithm comes into play. It compares the boxes detected in each pair of adjacent frames and effectively says, hey, this frame has a box here, and in the next frame, there is a slightly larger box that shifted a bit to the left and down. I'm pretty sure they both correspond to the same car. Once the object tracker finishes its job, we have a complete on-screen trajectory for every car that passes by. And that's it. The boring technical part is halfway done. Soon, we'll be able to do actual driver behavior study. But first, let's calculate the speed of every car and find out who is speeding. According to government standards, the distance between two road markings is supposed to be exactly 17 meters. We can verify that using the ruler tool in Google Maps Satellite View. Here's what we do. For each car, we record the moment when the left edge of its bounding box first crosses the vertical line drawn through the first road marking. Then we note the time when it crosses the second vertical line drawn through the last marking visible on the screen. The difference between those timestamps gives us the time it took the car to travel the distance, 17 meters multiplied by 11 markings, which equals 187 meters. From that, we can calculate its speed. Of course, all those calculations weren't performed in real time on this little single board computer. It didn't have enough processing power or battery capacity to handle that. It was only running a minimal Linux installation and its only job was to record the video stream from the USB camera onto the SD card, then stop at night and resume again when daylight returns. Later, I would come by to pick up the box, remove the SD card, and upload the footage to an Amazon cloud instance. It took a few more hours for a powerful data center grade GPU to process an entire day's worth of traffic video. The results are on the screen. On our section of the freeway, 40% of the driver's speed then, a few kilometers down the road, on a section controlled by an average speed control camera, only 7% of the drivers actually speed. Past that camera, 24% of the drivers speed again. The camera didn't do much in terms of preventing speeding outside its immediate vicinity, 
And frankly, that's totally okay. As one classic said, Speed has never killed anyone. Suddenly becoming stationary, that's what gets you. This joke actually has a deeper meaning that will help us understand how to truly make our roads safer. Now, let's think logically. If suddenly becoming stationary is what gets you in trouble, then to avoid trouble, you must not become stationary suddenly. Which means, if you ever want to become stationary, you must only do it gradually. Which also means, when driving, you must have some safe distance in front of you, so that when you hit the brakes, they have enough time to gradually absorb the kinetic energy of your car before making it to a full stop. Unsurprisingly, that knowledge is actually quite common. Most traffic agencies recommend a so-called three-second rule. When following a vehicle on the freeway, maintain a distance that your car does in three seconds. When going 120 km per hour, a standard freeway speed here in Spain, this distance is exactly 100 meters. Any following distance shorter than that might not give the driver the time to react adequately if something unexpected happens on the road. So what I want to do now is measure how many drivers actually abide by the safe following distance rule. Because just by glancing at random moments of the video, or by driving on our roads in general, I would say, not many. To do this, we'll need to help the computer figure out which lane each car is in, and then measure the distance between any two cars in the same lane. This might sound trivial to us, but again, it's actually not so obvious for a computer. The main problem is that even though we can measure the distance between two road marks accurately, because we already know it's 17 meters, we can't measure the distance between any two random points on the road. This is because the image has perspective distortion. For example, this road mark is 17 meters long and shows up as 85 pixels on the screen while the same road mark over here measures 235 pixels. The road mark closer to the camera looks bigger than the one farther away. To help the computer handle this, we'll apply a so-called homography transform to the image. It looks super weird now, but you can see that all the road marks are the same size in pixels. This means we can now measure distances in pixels and then simply multiply by some constant factor to convert them to meters. Now that the preparation is done, let's write some code to perform some calculations and see the results. Here's a chart showing the distances between all pairs of cars traveling in the same lane. It's very different from the vehicle speed distribution charts I created in my previous research. My camera was observing a stretch of road approximately 250 meters long, and within that range, the following distances between vehicles are distributed almost uniformly. Considering that there is an official recommendation to maintain a minimum following distance of 100 meters, I would have expected to see a bell curve, similar to the speed distributions. But no, this chart makes it look like there are no rules at all, and following distances are chosen at random. 20% of drivers follow the car ahead at a distance less than half of the recommended safe distance. 14% kept a distance under 40 meters. 8% of drivers kept a distance of less than 30 meters. 30 meters also seems to be the most commonly used following distance for some reason. That's another curious discovery as I researched, and we'll talk about that later. In my opinion, what we've just seen is far more dangerous than speeding. Let me prove my point with some numbers. The original 3 second rule assumes that the average driver reaction time is 0.9 seconds. That's the time it takes to perceive a hazard, for example something falling out of the car ahead, decide on a response, such as braking, and begin taking action, move the foot to the brake pedal and start to brake. Next, let's assume a typical deceleration rate on a dry road surface, which is about 8 meters per second squared. If you plug these values into the standard motion equations we all learned in high school, we arrive at the recommended safe following distance of 100 meters. Now, what happens if the speed is higher or the following distance is shorter? How can we compare these two situations? Let's introduce the so-called safety index. The safety index is calculated by dividing the distance you have available in front of you by the distance you need to come to a full stop. If this index is less than 1, 
you will roll over any obstacle on the road or crash into the car ahead. If the index is 1 or greater, you are within a safe stopping distance. Let's calculate this index for various scenarios. For instance, driving at a speed limit that only have the recommended safe following distance, a behavior observed in 20% of drivers, is just as dangerous as driving at 180 km per hour, something only 0.075% of drivers did. Maintaining a following distance of 40 meters is as risky as driving at 200 km per hour, a speed reached by just a few drivers over the two days of observation. And doing this, this simply has no reasonable explanation. My camera captured just so many drivers tailgating. Truckers do this to save in fuel, although here in Spain it's not very common. I only saw a few occurrences. A camper is tailgating a cistern. He's probably very curious about what's inside. Cars form whole packs with just a few meters between them. Why aren't there any automatic systems that would issue fines to tailgating drivers? I'm by no means a supporter of government surveillance. I'm just trying to understand their logic. There are cameras that fine you for using your phone or going without a seatbelt. The modern governments are well equipped with technology. And if they could, they would have also created an anti-tailgating camera. But tailgating is more complicated than speeding. For example, you can actually become a tailgater against your will if someone cuts in front of you. This happened a lot in the videos I recorded. And when it happens to you, you do what? Slam the brakes in order to return to safe following distance as soon as possible, at any cost? Simply observing cars on a given section of the roads and accusing drivers of maintaining dangerously short following distances without considering any prior context does not align with the principles of justice. What seems like a straightforward issue, tailgating or not keeping a safe distance from the vehicle ahead, turns out to be more complex and, in practice, nearly impossible to prove using a stationary camera. Governments will continue to enforce speed limits simply because it's the only thing they actually can do while drivers will keep maintaining unsafe following distances. But why do they do that? Let's look at the following distance distribution chart again. Notice there is an inflection point around 30 meters. Very few people drive at a distance of less than 30 meters, yet this very threshold also seems to be the most common following distance. Is 30 meters just a random number, or is there an explanation behind it? Let's recall the average driver reaction time we discussed earlier. 0.9 seconds. Of course, well-trained drivers who are fully focused can react much faster, but a relaxed, slightly tired driver, calmly cruising on the freeway and lost in thought, will typically react to danger in about 0.9 seconds. At a standard speed of 120 km per hour, a car travels exactly 30 meters in 0.9 seconds. This means that if the car in front of you suddenly brakes, you'll have precisely 0.9 seconds to react and hit the brakes to avoid the collision. Maintaining a following distance of 30 meters gives you just enough time to do that. Drivers instinctively sense what feels like a safe distance, and this unwritten, intuitive rule generally works for them, until it doesn't. The car in front might suddenly become stationary because it hit something, or its brakes might simply be better than yours. But these are unlikely pessimistic scenarios. Most people are optimists. They drive like this every day. Everyone around them drives the same way, and nothing bad happens, only reinforcing that sense of confidence. Unsafe following distances spread like a plague. If you maintain a 100 meter gap in dense traffic, other drivers, who see that distance as excessive, will constantly cut in front of you, forcing you to brake repeatedly. The temptation to shorten the gap becomes strong, and many won't resist it. The only thing we can do is educate ourselves, and those willing to listen, about the dangers of driving with insufficient following distance. Plagues can be controlled, and if more tailgating leads to even more tailgating, then less tailgating will lead to less tailgating. External enforcement of following distance isn't really possible, because it's not always clear who is tailgating and who was just cut off. The only thing we can do is to be nice on the road, treat others the way we'd like to be treated, and hope they follow our example. No tailgate, road
don't tell, dang. 